you know, what has driven me crazy. And I, I think a, a listener sent this to me. I don't know if uh, she sent it to me via Twitter or uh, uh, on uh, uh, through uh, majority reporters at gmail.com. Uh, but this Jonathan Alter piece, and <laughs> it, 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 it just is, it drives me crazy. Um, well, you know, first of all, you know Alter is a, is a cancer survivor. Yes. And so someone and so he somehow doesn't can't extract you know take that experience and say what would it be like to not have health insurance what would his life be like well you know the funny there? thing is though is that i think that like you know his health insurance he's not he's not, you know that maybe that's why uh his big blind side is in social security as opposed to maybe things like medicare uh it or, could be right and, and you know i have had numerous exchanges with jonathan alter uh, in green rooms over the years about Social Security. And a year or two ago, he was talking about, you know, raise the age, why not? And we had a, an extended uh, uh, email exchange where I said, well, you know, the problem is, is that uh, you keep talking about life expectancy has gone up, but the fact is it's only gone up for people in the upper uh, income distribution. And, and frankly, I'm also not quite sure that um, life expectancy gone up hasn't been a function of Social Security and, uh, and Medicare to some degree. You know, all of the, all of the justifications of why we can cut Social Security, uh, the, that wealthy people, and it's, it's wealthy people who say this. There, there are no, you know, I have yet to see anyone who is going to, who, who is in the, um, the middle income, uh, one of the, the bottom three income quintiles, in other words, 60% of the country who has ever advocated for cuts in Social Security. You just do not see it because they know how important it is to them. Uh, and and they're yeah. t- we're talking about 60% of the, uh, of the country relying on Social Security for uh, over 50% of their income in their, in their <laughs> retirement. That's uh, right. Uh, and there's a few other important things to this. First of all, when these guys toss on the figures about life expectancy, what they leave out is most of that life expectancy gain has come from, from infant mortality going down because of, of uh, you know, in coming up with all sorts of uh, ways to prevent things like polio. Um, right. you know, if you measure that, it from age 65, there's been very little of a gain. That's exactly right. If you made it to a certain age, I think that age was 20 or 18, I don't remember what it was, then you were going to, that, that, those gains above those ages have been virtually non-existent. I mean, yeah, they exist, but they're not, you know, they're almost non-existent. And, and so it's, it's infant mortality going down. So it's not, that's one thing. Second of all, it's, 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 it's an arrogance about the type of money you make, but it's also an arrogance about your occupation. Because the truth is, is that Jonathan Alter, you know, and, and you and I have this luxury, too, if we're lucky. And again, I'm still smart enough to know that, knock on wood, uh, you know, something like what happened to Mark Kirk could happen to any of us right. any day. But likely, if that doesn't happen, people like you and me, the types of jobs we do, we could probably do well into our 70s. All right? Jonathan Alter can keep writing his columns and his books and whatever. It's not backbreaking labor. It's not construction. It's not something that really, you're at, at the age of 60, 65, you're having a damn hard time doing it anymore without your body falling apart. Right. Um, and, and so there's, there's a bias in that, too. It's that for those of us who are lucky enough to work behind a desk, you know, or, you know and, and to be able to talk for a living and write for a living and do things like that, you know, chances are we're going to be able to do that a lot longer and not have to rely on Social Security and be able to do it on our own, on our own schedule. You know, we do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, supplement your income when you need to. Um, and so that, that is a huge thing he's missing. And obviously, the income level is a big part of it, as you said. I mean, I almost imagine, I almost, in my own imagination, I sit here and I, 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 I picture when they were figuring out where the tax cutoff was going to be. The people like Jonathan Alder were sitting in the room and like, you know, with their with you know their various income streams, were like, well, I make four twenty five, so let's keep it, <laughs> let's keep that tax rate above, you know, it's like that zone of where most like well, uh, you know, most of the guys who are Washington pundits who get on TV a lot and write their columns and write their books, that kind of income level, you know, the two fifty to four fifty, I suspect a lot of them fall in there, right. Um, and and so that was the perfect place. You're gonna get. You're gonna you're gonna extend those tax cuts. That was a good place to to extend them. You know. Right. And of course, um, they're also they're hanging out chasing people who are making millions of dollars. So they perceive themselves as uh, cash strapped. That's right. 
I'm That's only right. making 300 and, grand a year. I can barely send three of my kids to a uh, $40,000 a year private school. That's uh, exactly right. I'm feeling I'm not feeling really worried about food, but sending the three kids to, to, to private school and having the swimming lessons and, you know, everything else is, is going to strap you a little bit. And I'm not trying to say that I think people that make uh, $250,000 a year are in the same league as people that make $10 million a year. I, I've argued before, and I've said that earlier, that I think those should be separate tax brackets, and that uh, I, I would argue for bringing back the uh, what I would call the Reagan first term, uh, uh, you know, uh, tax bracket. Right. I think it should be fifty percent for people making above a few, you know, whatever it might be, a couple million dollars. Because yeah, they do make much more money than people making two hundred fifty, who also make much more money than people who make fifty. And so I, I do think there should be some sort of a differentiation. It, but the people that uh, that get me, people like Alter, that don't see that, that they, you know, who, who apparently see, you know, doesn't see below him any differentiation. Oh, they'd be okay without their Social Security. They're doing just fine, like me. Now, as I'm specifically referring to because you know we've seen there is. I mean, it's fascinating to me that there is a a um, a section of the center left supposedly um that immediately after the uh, fiscal cliff uh, deal and we uh, we'll, we'll talk about that we'll analyze that a little bit uh, too have come out and basically said now here come the liberals who are all complaining and they don't realize either that uh, the president won the, uh, won whatever that means uh, and they better not interfere with his ability to cut entitlements, you know, come uh, the debt ceiling fight. This is, let me read a little bit from uh, Alter's thing here, because uh, people should hear this. I mean, he starts it off. You can already hear the rumbling in the distance. A train with an Alter-esque of, affectation. Too, unbelievable. Yeah. A train of noisy liberal Democrats barreling straight <laughs> for the White House. Uh, I think at this point, you know, we're talking about maybe a small school bus. Never mind a train of those people, but um, the president already has his hands full dealing with angry and unrealistic uh, Republicans. Now he's getting reacquainted with their counterparts on the left, a less ideologically inflexible bunch, but not necessarily any more susceptible to reason. And oh. yeah, I mean, this is just like. Uh, can, I speak, can I say something else quickly? Because this is important to me. Please. I'm offended. I'm offended as a writer. <laughs> I mean, people pay this guy to write. Like, if you go through this column, and I'm sorry, I know, it's me being a little bit obnoxious here. But, man, when you read someone like, you know, Charlie Pierce or Matt Taibbi or some people who can actually write, and then you read this stuff with every cliche, with every sort of, uh, you know, uh, every sort of BS, right? Hey, as Will Rogers said, the Democrats are, or, or I'm know, not part of an organized party. I'm a Democrat. I mean, Literally, I mean, could you write any lazier than this guy? Okay, I'll get off that. Damn, uh, I just yeah, I, help that, it. I mean, yes, now he he goes on and he says, uh, I've he he begrudgingly says, you know, liberals did keep their mouths shut during the 2012 election uh, to you know to make sure that they didn't help Romney, but here they come again. Um, they came dangerously close to derailing landmark health care reform for what they had been fighting since the Progressive Bull Moose Party Convention of 1912. All right, well, good for him. He, he knows um, some uh, Reader's Digest history here. And, and, uh, and actually, I, look, he, he knows he, he it, knows but he repeats it. it without actually understanding because what that, what that 1912 Bull Moose platform called for was for universal single-payer single, single payer, uh, health care. Well, so this would be a little different. I'm not saying that Obamacare, in my opinion, is not much better than having nothing. It is. Uh, I'm giving and, you one of these <laughs> for that. That was a uh, touche. I don't know if you heard that, but... Um, that was nice. Um, but But... Yeah, but but yes. So yeah, and and also I would uh, take um, uh, I would take umbrage at his recent history because no, the bill wasn't in danger because of liberals. The bill was in danger because of people like him, like people like Joe Lieberman. Uh, the bill was in danger because of people like Max Baucus and Conrad. Yeah. Uh, this was not uh, the, it wasn't liberals up, uh, you know holding up this bill. Uh, to the extent that the, there was any any chance that this wasn't going to pass, it was the uh, blue dog Democrats and the so-called centrists who were holding this up. If we had had, um, you know, a 55-year-old uh, buy-in for Medicare, like Joe Lieberman supported back when he, when the insurance companies were saying, hey, we don't have a sustainable business model, uh, can you get some of our older people onto Medicare? And so we'll right. have just, you know... People from 25 to 55 to ensure, then we can uh, we can work this out. 
Uh, those were the people who endangered the Affordable Care Act at the end of the day. But leaving that aside, he goes on to talk about <clears throat> why uh, liberals were upset with the fiscal cliff deal. It was because it went from 250 to 450, and um, they complained that he keep violated also his known as princi- at least one extra vacation a year for the Alter family. Right, exactly. They put an extra <laughs> six grand in our pockets, um, and they were upset because he compromised. My, and I want to get your take on this fiscal cliff thing, but the biggest. The biggest failure, in my estimation, about that deal that President Obama made was that it was unnecessarily made when it was made. Look, at the end of the day, the difference between four, two fifty and four fifty, uh, I, you know, I'm I'm less concerned with that at the end of the day than I am that you never made the Republicans pay a price. The one thing that he touts in this is that the one achievement of the fiscal cliff deal was that it violated the Hastert rule. Which is the uh, the Dennis Hassett rule that required a majority of the majority Republican caucus to proceed on legislation? First off, they who can who cares? Re- that was a Republican rule. Who what do cares? I care about that? Who cares? They can reinstate it tomorrow if they want to. It's not a real rule. No one cares. It doesn't hurt them politically <laughs> at all. If it if it did, we would have seen. Um, uh, we wouldn't see Speaker Bonaire today. Uh, it would this be is somebody- such a classic Washington piece. I mean, basically, procedure was upset, uh, even though this is a, 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 a thing that was put in place by Republicans during Hastert. It was a Republican decision to do it, not Democrats. So I don't even understand the relevance of it. Uh, who the hell cares? Right. But procedure was upset and shared sacrifice, and liberals are complaining like conservatives, and they're both extremists and share, you know, and all that crap. And in the end, what this comes down to is, is that you know, people who are uh, whether they're on the left or you can call them populist, working class people or whoever it is who are, who are pissed off about this, are pissed off about it for a reason. Because if you're on the wealthy side, and you have to give up a little bit. You have to give up a little bit. That's versus people that may be giving up food and medication, which people like Jonathan Alter can't seem to freaking understand. And, I mean, so when he acts like, oh, it's just the liberals complaining, it, just, it gets me so mad when I read that crap. Because it's like, oh, it's just them complaining because they want to, you know, get their pound of flesh like conservatives. No, maybe I actually care about people not dying. And Could so, it be that? And, 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 and then he segues into bragging about the demise of the Hassert rule or maybe the temporary suspension of it or whatever. I mean, honestly, I think there are more implications to the Republicans coming in, taking over the House, and making sure that all the cups were styrofoam again. That has actual more implications in the world than the Hassert rule. Uh, but then he just moves from there Sort of as a complete non-segue. Now, and, and this is what's important about this piece. If there is any writer out there of, of this ilk that has a closer relationship with the White House, I don't know who it oh. is. Oh, of right? I mean, I mean, that's you, what this he'll is about. Defend them to the end. He wrote that look, fawning book about them. Yes, and it's not just a question of defending them. I, I mean, look, there he has his sources, and uh, he very well may believe this stuff that he writes. I'm sure he does. But the fact of the matter is, he has those sources because those sources trust him to carry a certain amount of water for the Obama administration. Now, I'm not saying there's a quid pro quo here. It's just that like-minded people can uh, uh, tend to uh, gather together. And uh, so they're But you they're know, simpatico. Sam, it's also culture, too. Often it's a situation where it's sort of in Washington where you, there are expectations from certain people that you do certain things, it's kind of like in corporate a corporate setting, the same thing, and often something doesn't need to be said. It's kind of like when you work at a newspaper and you want to report on something terrible. Nobody has to tell you not to do it because you look around and you see what people are talking about and doing above you, and you just kind of know not to do it. Well, in, in, in this case, there may not be an actual quid pro quo, but it doesn't have to be. He wants access to the White House. He probably wants to write another book or two on Obama. And, you know, he's internalized what he needs to do to get that done. Right. And so then he segues literally from the uh, achievement of the fiscal cliff deal. This is the only one that he refers to, incidentally. I mean, aside from the fact that supposedly we got Republicans to uh, raise taxes. No, no. Republicans didn't raise taxes. 
Unless you say that when they made the sunset provision on the Bush tax cuts that they raised taxes, because Republicans didn't raise taxes. When this deal was voted upon, the, the moment anybody took a vote on this, not when the handshake was, but when the, mo- when the moment the deal was voted upon, taxes were already up on everybody. They were right. up on everybody. And because President Obama didn't let uh, it be very clear, you don't even have the political advantage of saying that these 151 Republicans in the House who voted against this were voting against a tax cut. And right. it's, I mean, that, see, that's my, my, that's my issue. I mean, you asked before, and I didn't really, you know, we, were, we got off on, on talking, still talking about Alter, which is important. But my take on this whole deal, again, is exactly like yours. I don't really, the, the difference between 250 and 450 is not a huge deal to me. Because, again, in our economy right now, my thoughts are that, that people in the 250 to 450 range probably still spend some money. And having some more money in their pockets probably isn't the worst thing in the world. It's really how we got there that, that is my problem. My problem is, is that any deal that should have been made, first of all, should not have allowed for that obscene estate tax uh, yeah. uh, you know, exemption, which now is what? I guess up to $5 million. It, it, $5 million, it's for five individual. million yeah. per spouse. So it's right. $10 million per couple. Yep. And 40%, you know, as opposed to going back up to what it was before. Was it 50 or 55? 55 so after that, a million. That, that, that's an obs- that was obscene. They didn't touch the carried interest loophole. I mean, that is, that's the most obscene thing sitting there. And dividends. I mean, it, it dividends is also the big thing. People are legally avoiding paying their taxes, and we're not doing anything about it. Right. Dividends was 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 also a very big deal in my estimation. Uh, and then but, on, and and then and then I would throw in the, the, the those things were more fa- much more offensive to me than, than the two fifty to four fifty. Um, where again, I think that there could be a justification made for wanting some people in that. And, and here's the thing, sort of you have the leverage, more. you wait a couple of days, you have the leverage, you offer bills that basically provide for the same tax cut, even if you want to do it at the 450 level, and you put on there, you include in those bills these type of provisions, not just on uh, on things like dividends and whatnot, but also provisions of like, um, you know what, uh, the debt ceiling provision or That's the it. sequester. That was what I was get to. Or the you, provision that we're not going through this crap with the debt ceiling again. Or, we're not letting you nihilistic imbeciles take this country hostage. Or you punt, you punt the sequester stuff, because that's supposedly where the line of demarcation is going to be put. And I, and I say that only because of what uh, Alter writes and what we keep hearing over and over again. The president is committed to not uh, f- uh, forsaking the executive power to uh, pay uh, the government's bills. But, you know, when it comes to the sequester, that's another thing. So he, ta- he, he basically goes from the Hastert rule to just as Republicans must learn to live with tax increases, Democrats must learn to live with and vote for changes in entitlements. Now, by changes... Right, so what he's saying, let's be clear, well, just as Republicans must learn to live with people who are rich being taxed a little bit more, Democrats must learn to live with people not living. Right. Well, I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. But you know what? We're talking about people dying Republicans in the don't have to don't have learn to live money. with tax increases, and they didn't have to vote for it. They didn't. That's true. 150, the majority of the de- Republican caucus, three times uh, the members of the Republican caucus voted against, and it wasn't even, they weren't even voting for a tax increase. They were voting for a tax cut. Uh, they wouldn't even do that. And so he's, he's, He's misstating the reality. You wait a couple of days. You offer them up to four fifty. You throw in, the, you know, debt ceiling. Hell, I would, I would take it off the table for the rest of his entire term. Um, you know, tie it to a tax cut up to to four fifty. Don't raise if you want to give them a little something else. Fine, capital gains maybe doesn't go up to twenty eight. We'll put it up to twenty five. Give them, give them some scraps of what would be tax cuts. You know, lower it from twenty. I mean, I'm not saying I want that, but I'm saying you could give them a lot less, a lot fewer things. And get everything you want if you'd waited. Yes. That's what I'm saying. And I'm not saying I have the perfect formula of what everything is. I would have been willing to go up to 450, you know, if that was what it took to get the debt ceiling off the table, protect all earned benefit programs without being touched, get the estate tax back up to a reasonable place to be. I mean, I even would be willing, as I said, uh, I'll give them a point or two cut in the capital gains tax if that would get it done, too. You know, I'd give them little things that, that to me, aren't, aren't as big in the big picture. But... We didn't do that. No. So, there and you so go. now, and so, now yeah. we're being told, we're being scolded uh, that liberals got to stand back and allow the president to uh, cut entitlements. Yeah. I mean, we don't want to be difficult or anything or actually advocate for things we believe in. Or, again, 
to get this out of the, the point of abstraction to where it is, stop people from dying. Because I guess I'm just going to have to keep repeating that because I'm not going to let this shared sacrifice garbage get through there. Because in the end, somebody giving up a pair of yacht slippers or you know, only staying at the five-star hotel in the Bahamas for six days instead of seven uh, is not the equivalent in the end uh, of somebody who may say to themselves, I can only have two meals today. And it's different. And what's stunning to me is just sort of like, you know, what is, even if this is what his perspective is, where is the problem? What is it that liberals will derail by arguing against a cut in entitlements? What, I mean, what is it exactly? What's the danger here? Like, why is it necessary for this scold? I mean, we're being sold this in such an intense way. Um, and, you know, and, and what is, you know, like, I can understand the argument of, like, you know, uh, you don't want to empower Mitt Romney. You don't want Mitt Romney to become president. What, what is the danger now? There's nothing. Uh- I mean, this no, is exactly what President Obama supposedly wants. Make me do it, you know. But, right. but I mean, this is what, what sort of like rips off the veneer and the, and the lies of these people. It's like, don't get in the way of our agenda is what they're saying. They're not saying you're and going would, to empower anything else. But, yeah, and I would say quickly, you know, when it comes to I, people say we've got no leverage over Obama anymore and that kind of thing. And I disagree with that. Um, I think you, you have obviously you've got leverage over congressmen and senators who have to run for re-election. Yes, but I do. I, one thing that's very clear to me about President Obama is that he cares deeply about his legacy. And I don't know who it is, which group of us or whatever. But the truth is, when you think of the people you have on your show, and you think of places that, from the from the various uh, blogs, think tanks on the left and things. I mean, I'm not saying we have what we, what we should have. Uh, TV networks, although we're losing one of those, um, and, and things of that sort, people that can shape opinion. You know, I think people should make it pretty clear to this guy that we're going to do some early writing on his legacy. He yeah. cut Social Security and Medicare. Yeah, I you mean, know? I think I the mean, more pushback uh, that this type of stuff gets now in the next two months as these deals are being formulated, the, the better. I, I, yeah, and I think people should make it clear. You know, we're going to be a large part of what defines your legacy. It's not just going to be Jonathan Alter. Yeah, there are plenty of people, progressives, in places, you know, in various places, from MSNBC to Sam Cedar's yeah, radio show to the wonderful We Act Radio, everyone, to, you know, various places that, that those of us write for. I mean, there are blogs, there are mainstream publications. This isn't 1995 anymore. It's not even 2000 anymore. It's a different time. <clears throat> and what, what, you know, what people like us say actually gets out there. And I, you know, how much I don't know, but I'd be willing to make the case to President Obama. We'll take it out for a spin. He wants to see how his legacy does. So he wants to be, if he wants to be known for the as the guy who destroyed FDR's legacy, I'd be happy to brand him with that if he's tries well, cutting. Well, I, I think I, I still believe that the the real pressure points that we have now are. Uh, in the Senate and in the House. I mean, you know, I think it's... Obviously a, much more, yes. I'm not saying that what we have with Obama is equal. I'm just saying I don't accept we have zero leverage with him. That's all I'm saying. Well, but I agree. The Senate and the, I mean, the House is obvious, and there's a number of senators. <clears throat> you brought up one of them earlier, Max Baucus, up for re-election two years. You want to ever prove you're willing to... I don't like using this phrase in light of recent events, but willing to shoot a hostage, you know, willing to, to take somebody out on your own side... I think a hell of a nominee would be Max Baucus for that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think there has he, to be. I think we have he's to get up very in a put, tough state to win it in 2014. Very aggressive, and the thing is that there's, the, you know, um, there's there's room to lose a couple of Democratic senators. Definitely, that's right. There's definitely we've got that uh, we've got a little bit of that leeway. All right, well, Cliff, maybe we can get uh, Lieutenant Governor, the former Lieutenant Governor Halter, I think his name was, who ran against. Uh, 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 our friend, uh, what the hell is her name? Help me out here, Sam. I'm losing my mind. Oh, uh, um, uh, 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 um uh, what's her Blanche name? Lincoln. Blanche Lincoln. Well, well, Mark Pryor's coming up in 2014. Maybe Halter's in the mood for another run. Yep. I'm just saying he was a legitimate guy who came within, what, one percentage point? Two? Uh-huh. I don't remember anymore. Came pretty close to knocking her off. I'm just saying there's people out there, you know, who can run against some of these, some of these guys who are up in 2014. And well, I think we should make it clear we'd be willing to support him. 